welcome to ra online so today's topic is hiv in pregnancy and uh, first thing to define in this is uh, the human immunodeficiency virus when it attacks your t cells and it uses them to make copies of itself and it destroys many of the cells then the clinical signs and symptoms in the patient is called as acquired immunodeficiency syndrome so uh, this hiv virus has a very specific affinity to t helper lymphocytes and they causes a depletion of the t helper lymphocytes so when a virus enters a healthy person it destroys the t helper lymphocytes and as it reproduces uh, the gradually the immune system is broken down and the cells cannot fight back the infection against hiv and the other uh, diseases and carcinomas also manifest so how does it spread it spreads unprotected sex with an infected person it spreads via transfusion of infected blood and blood products it spreads by sharing of contaminated syringe and needles while in iv injections and tattooing it spreads from mother to her baby so today we'll be focusing on the fourth slide which is prevention of hiv transmission from mother to the baby so this we have already seen so pregnancy childbirth and breastfeeding is a time where somebody can contract hiv and uh, today we'll discuss how to do ptct that is parent to child transmission prevention of transmission of this virus uh, we should realize that hiv is not transmitted by insect biting toilet seats kissing sharing cutlery or touching so once the hiv infection leads to the manifestations of the disease so disease can carry the symptoms of headache difficulty in concentrating skin rash fever night sweats it can also cause nausea vomiting diarrhea it can also cause uh, nail thickening and curving person can have weight loss and fatigue uh, the hiv infected persons can develop lymph node swellings respiratory system they can be dry cough pneumonia and sore throat they can be myalgia or muscle pain and then there can be arthralgia or joint pain so whenever these are uh, symptoms are manifested in an hiv infected individual it is called as aids now there are some opportunistic infections which happen in an hiv infected individual so brain can get infected with cryptococcal cocci causing cryptococcal meningitis toxoplasma causing toxoplasmosis in the eye there are they can be cytomegalovirus infections in the mouth and throat there can be cold sores and thrush ulcers of candidiasis in the lungs there can be histoplasmosis pneumocystis carinii pneumonia and tuberculosis in the stomach there can be cytomegalovirus infection cryptococcus porodiosis mycobacterium gut tuberculosis in the liver there can be hepatitis c virus in the reproductive system the hiv virus infection can lead to presence of other genital ulcers human papilloma virus cervical cancers menstrual abnormalities pelvic inflammatory disease urinary tract infections and vaginal opportunistic yeast infections and candidiasis so first if a person is exposed to an hiv virus we should defined what was the exposure so was it, was it an exposure grade 0 1 2 or 3 a grade 0 exposure is when the hiv virus got infected with intact skin and there was a non infectious source material so if any person we don't know that the hiv negative person or hiv unknown status get exposed with an intact skin so for that no post exposure prophylaxis is needed if the exposure was to a hiv positive asymptomatic individual so in intact skin whether it is an hiv positive asymptomatic hiv positive symptomatic or hiv status unknown in the intact skin exposure no pep is needed if there is an exposure of grade 2 that is mucous membrane or a non intact skin with a small volume gets exposed with an hiv positive asymptomatic viral load low viral load individual then you have to give the basic regimen high viral load exposure grade 1 basic regimen hiv status unknown just the basic regimen will do if the exposure grade was 2 that means the blood got in contact with mucous membrane or with skin with a 
large volume with several drops or scratch or a solid needle or a long time then we have to start basic regimen if the exposing source was low viral load and we have to start the expanded regimen if the exposing source was that of a higher viral load. If there is a percutaneous large volume then we have to give expanded regimen in a low or high viral load exposures. Now how do we prescribe post exposure prophylaxis? It should be started within 2 hours of exposure. Total duration of post exposure prophylaxis is 4 weeks and they need to start a drug pack which contain one dose of all the drugs which is available at all the times. So this drug should be available in all the OTs and all in the labor rooms because it has to be started within two hours of exposure and those who are on post exposure prophylaxis should avoid sexual intercourse, pregnancy or breastfeeding or donation of blood, organ, tissue or semen for six months. So this post exposure prophylaxis treatment can be accessed through the doctor emergency rooms uh, in the HIV clinics and it should be started idly within 2 hours of exposure if not started within 2 hours till 20 till 72 hours of exposure it can be started. It should be continued for 4 weeks once started and uh, they keep testing regularly.